Our scripture reading is Acts chapter 25, verses 13 to 27. Acts 25, beginning there in verse 13. And after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. When they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a certain man left a prisoner by Felix, about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me, when I was in Jerusalem asking for a judgment against him. To them I answered, It is not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before the accused meets the accusers face to face, and has opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against him. Therefore, when they had come together without any delay, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. When the accusers stood up, they brought no such accusations against him of things as I supposed, but had some questions against him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who had died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters." But when Paul appealed to be reserved for the decision of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So the next day, when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city, at Festus' command, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa <clears throat> and all the men who are here... <clears throat> present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. <clears throat> but when I found that he had committed nothing deserving death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him. I have nothing certain to write, my Lord, concerning him. Therefore, I have brought him out before you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. May the Lord be blessed by the reading and hearing of his word this morning. Please be seated. Our title this morning is Divine Appointments. Divine appointments. This picture is uh, done by an artist named Julia Bernadelli. And what she does is she takes spilled coffee and she makes art out of it. Okay? So this is spilled coffee art. All right? Why I use that picture is because in our lives, sometimes we spill the coffee, right? We, we make a mess or bad things happen. And the thing is God can take those and use them to accomplish something beautiful and use it to accomplish his purpose. So today we're talking about divine appointments. We're going to finish chapter 25. Let's begin with prayer. Father, we have gathered this morning in obedience to your word, which tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But we have come here, Father, from different weeks. Some people, a week of work, some a week of activity, maybe a week of frustration, a week of hardship or trial, maybe a week of great joy. And yet we gather here together, Father, as a community of believers to hear from your word, to sing your praises, to support your ministry, and Father, to fellowship. And I pray, Lord, that as we gather, you would work on our hearts that you, Father, through the power of your Holy Spirit, would take your word and change us. And so, Lord, I ask that you would set me aside, that it would just be your truth that is communicated today. And I pray that I would communicate your truth with passion and with clarity and with boldness. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So you get on the airplane and you are in your favorite seat the seat you picked by the window. Sitting in your seat by the window and someone's walking down the aisle and if you've flown much, everyone has this secret hope that maybe they'll be the one aisle that nobody else sits in, right? So you can stretch out and you can relax and take a nap, but this guy coming down the aisle sits right next to you. 
You start talking and you come to find out that his flight had been delayed. He was on this flight because he had been supposed to be on a previous flight and it got delayed and so here he is next to you. And so you commiserate about the frustration of flying and how difficult it can be. Then your conversation turns to the difficulties and the frustrations of life. And you share with them that, you know, it, when I have hard times, when my life seems to be hopeless, I go to Jesus. And I find comfort and security in knowing that my Savior is always with me. And your conversation takes a turn. And you begin to talk about the things of Christ. You share the gospel with the person. You lead them to Jesus Christ. And they are gloriously saved. And a new brother or sister is added to the family of God. What has just happened? We call this a divine appointment. See, our sovereign God, who doesn't change and doesn't make mistakes, orchestrates the affairs of our lives to bring us in contact with people who need Jesus. He provides gospel opportunities in the most unlikely circumstances, in the middle of everyday life, we are given divine appointments. That person waiting next to you in the mechanic shop may have had vehicle trouble just so that they can talk with you. Your car may have broken down just so you could share Christ with that person and with the tow truck driver and with the mechanic. That person sitting in the waiting room next to you has an incurable disease and it may be that you are having health issues just so that you can speak with them. That nurse taking your blood pressure, that parent waiting with you for practice to end, that student sitting next to you at lunch or on the bus, that coworker that you have. These are not chance encounters. These are not coincidences. See, if we believe in an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-encompassing God, we must also believe that he creates divine appointments. To see these opportunities for the divine appointments they are, we have to be led by the Holy Spirit. And our passage this morning, as we've read, is all about divine appointments, and, and we'll develop that more as we go. God has divine appointments in your life and in my life. To take advantage of the divine appointments in our lives, we have to recognize them. When divine appointments are recognized, we are able to share Christ. So to help us recognize a divine appointment, there's two questions that we're going to learn to ask. Question number one, what does a divine appointment look like? What does a divine appointment look like? You could say this is the packaging of a divine appointment, right? Wouldn't it be nice if every time we had a divine appointment, a voice from heaven would say, Hey, John, over there. And then there would appear this flashing arrow above somebody's head. Boop, boop, boop. Talk to that guy, right? Talk to that gal. That would be really awesome. Doesn't happen that way. Okay? The child of God is called to walk in the Spirit, to live by the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is, control of our, is in control of our lives, we are ready and able to share the gospel with anyone. And at his prompting, we share Christ at every opportunity. All that being said, divine appointments are often disguised. And there's two reasons why divine appointments are often hard to notice. Reason number one, a divine appointment is often hidden in the negative. A divine appointment is often hidden in the negative. So Paul, we're going to see, has two seemingly negative circumstances that often accompany divine appointments. So when something negative happens in your life, there's something we need to ask. Is this just a frustration or is it a divine appointment? And the answer to that could depend on our attitude. If we're so focused on what's going in our life that we miss what God is doing, then it's just going to be a frustration. We need to be ready and willing to take advantage of every opportunity to proclaim Christ. So Paul has two seemingly negative circumstances here. And the first is the limitation of freedom. Look at verse 13. Acts chapter 25, verse 13. And after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. Now, this is the beginning of the divine appointments. Why? Because Agrippa and Bernice come to meet Festus. At least that's why they think they're coming, right? They think that they're coming for political reasons to greet the new governor and to get on his good side. But what they're really coming for, and we're going to find out, is to hear Paul and to be confronted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They don't know that yet, right? They're just coming to greet Festus. 
They didn't know Paul was there. They had their own purpose to greet Festus. God had a greater purpose for them to hear the gospel from Paul. Sometimes God works in obvious ways. Sometimes he works in subtle ways. And we've already seen this in Acts. Look at um, Acts chapter 8. So turn back to Acts chapter 8 and verse 26 and then verse 40. So this is, <coughs> excuse me, this is um, Philip and Philip is being directed. So first in verse 26, so an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. Right? So this is an obvious divine appointment. God says, get up, travel, and then later he's going to say, hey, look, there's a chariot. Go get in the chariot and talk to this guy. Okay? This is an obvious one. Look down at verse 40. Verse 40 of Acts chapter 8. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So he finishes talking to the Ethiopian eunuch, and God takes him and puts him in Azotus. These are obvious ways that God is leading. Hey, go talk to that guy in the chariot. Hey, you're in Azotus. Preach Christ, okay? But sometimes God is more subtle. Look at Acts 16. Acts 16, verses 16 to 18. Now remember, sometimes God's leading is hidden in negative circumstances. Acts 16, verse 16. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out within that very hour. Paul did not see this as a divine appointment. Paul saw this as something annoying, right? As this girl following them around the city and talking while he's trying to talk. And Paul just says, Holy Spirit, or, or evil spirit, get out of her, right? Now, what's interesting is what happens after this. They get arrested. And then they go put in prison. God miraculously releases them from prison while they're singing hymns and they lead the jailer to Christ, his whole family to Christ, and just like that, the Philippian church is born. This was a divine appointment. So sometimes God works subtly with a girl following Paul and annoying him and Silas. Sometimes he works obviously. These people coming together here in Acts 25 are a divine appointment though they do not yet realize it. Look at verse 14, Acts chapter 25, verse 14. When they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, there is a certain man left a prisoner by Felix. So Paul has been a prisoner for more than two years. We learned that in, in Acts 24, 27. From a human standpoint, this is negative, right? Two years without freedom, two years being held at the whim of a corrupt governor. Even though the two years have passed, the Jewish leaders are still want to kill Paul. In, Luke, in verse 3, Luke told us that there was another plot against Paul. This too seems like a negative. However, we need to be reminded that the opposition of these leaders is going to take Paul to Rome as God has directed. Paul is a prisoner. He's been in prison for two years. Does that seem like a negative? <laughs> it probably felt negative, being in prison and forgotten for two years. But it's a divine appointment. You see, God is at work. He has a plan and it's unfolding before our eyes. So that's his first seemingly negative circumstance is the limitation of his freedom. The second is the presence of hostility. Look at verse 15. About whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem asking for a judgment against him. So Festus is sharing with Agrippa and Bernice all that had transpired between himself, the Jewish leaders, and Paul. And he's going to ask for their help. He wants them to see the whole picture here. The Jewish leaders made criminal accusations against Paul. They wanted Festus to pass sentence. They're very hostile to Paul. We saw that they want to see him dead. Now, does that sound like a negative? <laughs> People want you dead. We usually see that as a negative, right? But remember, God has a purpose. Paul has appealed to Caesar. That means he's going to Rome. Rome is where God has called Paul to preach. Circumstances that seem horrible from our perspective can be used by God for his purpose and glory. 
I know a lady who she would tell you that she did not grow in her Christian life until God uh, allowed her to fall, take a fall and break both of her legs. She was sitting there for months, convalescing, started doing Bible studies, and that's when God really got a hold of her life. I know a man who didn't come to Christ until he was made a paraplegic through an accident. And he would tell you that was the best accident that ever happened to him. He came to Christ. Horrible circumstances can be used by God for his purpose and glory. Look at verse 16. Acts 25, verse 16. To them I answered, it is not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before the accused meets the accusers face to face and has opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against him. Now, earlier in this account, we're not given this information. He just said, uh, Augustus, or sorry, um, Festus said, oh, I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to be in Caesarea, so don't worry about coming to Jerusalem. Here we're given some more background. This custom of the Romans saved Paul's life because they were waiting to kill him. But they have a custom that the accused and the accusers need to meet face to face. Because of this custom, Paul is kept in Caesarea and not taken to Jerusalem. Thus, his life is saved from those planning to ambush him. What a coincidence, right? There's no such thing, just so we're all clear. God's in control. Not only does this Roman custom save Paul, it has guaranteed him an opportunity to proclaim Christ. It says that he's going to answer. Answer is the Greek word apologia, meaning defense. Paul will be given the opportunity to defend himself from the charges that have been made. Now, based on everything we've seen in the book of Acts, what do you think Paul is going to do when he's given this chance to defend himself? He's going to preach the gospel. God uses Roman custom to preserve Paul and give him a gospel opportunity. So he's been in prison for two years. His fellow Jews want him dead. He's been forced to appeal to Caesar. These seem like negative circumstances. And yet God is at work through them to give the gospel opportunity and place Paul right where he needs to be. So here's our lesson. When negative circumstances enter your life, be on the lookout for a divine appointment. Would you read that with me, please? When negative circumstances enter your life, be on the lookout for a divine appointment. God is at work. Opportunity is hidden within what seems negative. So that's reason number two, a div or number one, a divine appointment is often hidden in the negative. Reason number two, a divine appointment is often directed through uncertainty. It seems rare that God tells us exactly what he's doing. <laughs> Scripture reveals that we walk by what, not by sight? We walk by faith, not by sight. In the next verses, we'll find Paul's path is laid out through the uncertainty of others. Look at verse 17. Therefore, when they had come together without any delay, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. Again, this previous uh, actions are reviewed by Festus. Note with me, this is an official proceeding. He sits on the judgment seat, so it's official. And the words without delay in the next day indicate that this is a rushed affair. Festus is eager to do the Jews a favor. They're eager to be rid of Paul. And this haste ends up, I think, working in Paul's favor. Look at verse 18. When the accusers stood up, they brought no such accusations against him of such things as I supposed. Festus is, has an expectation of the things they're going to say. And when they stand up and accuse Paul, they don't say any of those things. Had the Jewish leaders taken more time to prepare, maybe they could have come up with more convincing arguments. <laughs> but they don't. Festus had an expectation of what they would say, and when they bring charges, verse 7 told us they couldn't even prove them. Earlier in the chapter, uh, we're not told the details of what is said, but Festus gives those here. Look at verse 19. 25 verse 19, but had some questions against him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who had died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. Questions uh, is the Greek word zetima, and it means issue or dispute. An important question that is in dispute and must be settled. So the Jewish leaders come, they accuse Paul, and Festus says, I did not expect what they were accusing him of. It was just a religious dispute. I can only imagine the shock of Festus, right? He's, he's expecting some heinous crime. He's expecting this, this grievous offense, and instead, they're making a religious argument. However, this religious argument is the most important argument ever. <laughs> Notice, Paul says, Jesus is alive. They say he died. Look at Romans 6, 9, and 10. 
knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Christ died. But then he rose again. <laughs> Christ died for our sins once for all. There is no other sacrifice that can be made for sin. He alone paid the penalty. Christ alone dealt with sin. But Jesus didn't stay dead. <laughs> Amen? This is the glorious truth we celebrate at Easter. Christ is risen from the dead. Death has no dominion over our Savior. He died once for all, now he lives. This is the debate, by the way. With this debate, everything is on the line, Paul says. If, if Jesus Christ died and never rose, we are miserable and should be pitied by all. 1 Corinthians 15. But if Jesus died and he rose again, he is the Savior. He is the Redeemer. He is the Messiah. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last. He is God in human flesh. That's what we celebrate at Christmas, which is coming up. Festus was very uncertain about their accusations, but what's awesome here is he's not uncertain about what Paul was claiming. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? He's very certain. Paul says he's alive. Even in the midst of uncertain circumstances, we are certain about who our God is and what he has done for us. And what we learn here is that in the course of the trial before Festus, Paul gave the gospel because you can't talk about the death and resurrection of Christ without going into why he died and why his resurrection is significant. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Festus had believed that he was there to pass judgment on Paul. Nope, that's not it. He was there because he had a divine appointment with the gospel. Beloved, Paul recognized this for what it was. It was a divine appointment. Was he still in prison? Yes. Was he still a target of assassination? Yes. Was he still going to be sent to Rome? Yes. But none of that mattered to Paul. <laughs> what mattered was faithfully proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ at every opportunity. You and I are going to have difficult circumstances. We're going to have trials. We're going to have hardships. We're going to have heartaches. But within those hard times are divine appointments. Don't miss them. Look at verse 20. Acts chapter 25, verse 20. And because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters. In verse 9, Luke tells us Festus wanted to do the Jews a favor. Festus says here that he was out of his depth. He was uncertain how to handle these questions. Both are true. Festus rightly does not feel qualified to deal with these questions. He also wants the Jews to owe him one, so he asks Paul to go to Jerusalem. Now we noted last week that Paul is a Roman citizen, has the right to appeal, and the right to go to Caesar. In an unexpected move, he does this, he appeals to Caesar, and again we must know that this is perfectly aligned with God's will. The uncertainty of Festus provides direction for Paul, and it's going to direct him to yet another divine appointment. Look at verse 21. But when Paul appeared to be, uh, to be reserved for the decision of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I could send him to Caesar. Now, we're about, we read about this earlier in the chapter. Paul appealed to Caesar. He's going to be transferred to Rome. But all through this process, Paul has dealt with uncertainty. Does anyone like uncertainty? Okay. I, I don't at all. I really like when I can lay out my schedule and know it's going to happen exactly like that. Um, does it ever do that? No, but I always want it to, you know? Paul has always been uncertain, right? He was uncertain when he first arrived back in Jerusalem and he found out that the Jews were all against him. Right? He was uncertain when he was arrested in the temple. He was uncertain when a mob tried to kill him. He was uncertain when the high priest broke the law during his trial. He was uncertain when there was a plot against his life. Uncertain when he was transferred to Felix and Caesarea. Uncertain when he stayed in prison for two years. Uncertain as he faced Festus. Uncertain now as he waits to go to Rome. And yet through all of this uncertainty, Paul has had one gospel opportunity after another. Paul doesn't sit there and bite his nails and say, I don't know what's going to happen, so I can't do anything. He says, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know who does, and I'm going to preach Christ. Over and over again, he has recognized divine appointments and he has taken advantage of them. And so here's our lesson. Don't allow an uncertain future to obscure gospel opportunities. Would you read that with me, please? 
Don't allow an uncertain future to obscure gospel opportunities. We walk by faith. We have no guarantee of safety. We have no guarantee of security. We have no guarantee of hell. We have this guarantee. That I'm as safe as God wants me to be until he calls me home. I'm as secure as God wants me to be until he calls me home. There is security in the center of his will. Though the storms rage and foes attack, our God is greater. And in the middle of our darkest hours, he shows himself strong. In the middle of our struggle, he has divine appointments. So that was question number one. What do divine appointments look like? Sometimes they look like negative circumstances. Sometimes they look like uncertainty. But we have to learn to see past ourselves and find the opportunities that God brings our way. So to recognize divine appointments, we ask a second question. Question number two, why are divine appointments given? Why are divine appointments given? <clears throat> As we finish out this chapter, we're going to discuss really the purpose of a divine appointment. Does anyone remember, we've talked about this a couple times, so if you don't remember, it's okay. But does anyone remember God, the twofold goal that God always has in suffering? The growth of the believer and gospel opportunities. Every time. There can be other purposes, but those are the two that are always constant. When God allows suffering into our lives, he wants us to grow and he wants us to share Christ. Okay? We've seen both of these taking place in the life of Paul. God has divine appointments for him to keep. And these divine appointments provide believers with three opportunities. Now, the opportunities we're going to see with Paul here are not always present in our lives, but usually one or two of them are. Opportunity number one, proclamation. <clears throat> proclamation. Acts chapter 25, verse 22. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. I just love this. Agrippa wants to hear what Paul has to say. I don't think he realizes what he's asking for here, right? He's asking for the gospel. He doesn't know it yet. <laughs> They're going to hear Paul. If Paul's given a chance to speak, what do you think he's going to talk about? <laughs> he's going to talk about Jesus. We already know that. How do we know that? Because in chapter 21, he's, he's arrested, and, in, and they're tr starting to drag him up the stairs to the fortress, and he says, stop, 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 let me talk to the mob. And what does he do? In chapter 22, he preaches the gospel to the people who were trying to kill him. He tells them that Jesus of Nazareth is alive, and he's in heaven, and he is the Messiah. In chapter 22, he talks to Felix. Felix is there to judgment, judge uh, Paul, and instead, Paul talks to him about the resurrection and the coming judgment. He preaches the gospel every chance he gets. He proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. This was Paul's burden and his passion. passion. We know that from Scripture. Let me look at just two verses. 1 Corinthians 1.17, Paul says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Now, would we all agree that baptism is important? Yeah? Okay. Now, baptism doesn't save you, but it's a very important thing. Right? Paul says, look, I realize that it's important, but that's not my purpose. Let someone else baptize him. I'm here to preach Christ. That is his passion. 1 Corinthians 9.16, For if I preach the gospel, he says, I have nothing to boast of, for a necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul says, look, I don't have a choice. If I don't preach the gospel, it's going to be bad. <laughs> We have other people in Scripture describing it as, as this fire burning within them. I believe it was Jeremiah who said, I tried to be silent. I tried not to share, but I couldn't stop. There was like a fire within me that had to get out. This is the attitude that Paul has. This is why God gives divine appointments so we can proclaim the gospel. And this reality demands something that we know how to share the gospel. So if you say, you know, I'm, I'm just not sure if I know how to do that. Well, we did a Sunday school class on it here at Grace Church of Lockford. So go to your favorite website, gracechurchoflockford.org. I don't even have to ask. I know that's everybody's favorite. Um, <clears throat> gracechurchoflockford.org. You go here, up here to the top where it says sermons. You click on that and it takes you to this page. And then you go on sermons and you click up here where it says filter by category. You go to series and it says personal evangelism. You click on that and it takes you here. All you got to do is scroll down and find part one. Listen to those. We talk about how to share your faith. How to, preach, how to share the gospel with someone. Now, why am I giving you the step-by-step -step directions um, so you don't have an excuse? I don't have an excuse. 
We know how to share the gospel. The most powerful thing that you have to share the gospel is your own testimony. Talk to them about what Christ did for you. We're going to see Paul do that in, in just next week. But we'll start to see it next week. We probably won't see all of it. You know how I am. Okay. <clears throat> Here's our lesson. We are given divine appointments to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you read that with me, please? We are given divine appointments to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. To do that, we have to recognize a divine appointment for what it is. The person who sat next to you wasn't an accident. It doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing. Once we have recognized them, we must be bold to take advantage of them. That's where it's hard, isn't it? <laughs> This is a matter of compassion for the lost. It's a matter of obedience to Christ. We must be sharing our faith. So opportunity number one is proclamation. Opportunity number two is vindication. Vindication. Now again, this doesn't mean that every time we have a gospel opportunity, we're going to be able to vindicate ourselves. Uh, it depends on what's going on. Paul has been a falsely accused, and this is going to be a vindication of him. Look at verse 23. So the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city at Festus' command, Paul was brought in. I just love this. Look at who's present for this meeting, right? The governor, a king, and, and his companion here, military leaders, prominent men of the city. Is this an accident? They all just happen to be like, oh, I got nothing to do today. I'm going to show up at this thing. Hear this guy, Paul. This is a divine appointment. These are divine appointments. This also highlights the reality that God desires all to be saved. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. If you're using our uh, Pew Bible, it's um, page 1362. 2 Tim sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and the first seven verses. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and the first seven verses. First Timothy chapter two, verse one. First Timothy chapter two, verse one. Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Paul says we're to pray for all men. And in this context, what are we to pray about? Their salvation. Right? Their salvation. This means we're to share Christ with them as we have opportunity. Right? Just, just praying for them to get saved. Right? Say you're praying for someone to get saved and then they come to you and they say, hey, I want to know about Jesus. You go, oh, well, ask my pastor. No. No. You prayed for them to get saved and God is giving you an opportunity to share Christ with them. We've already seen that many Roman leaders in this time were corrupt. There could have been a temptation in the early church to say, well, they don't deserve the gospel. They're oppressing the Jews. They're horrible people. They don't deserve the gospel. This can be a temptation today, right? Sometimes we think to ourselves, well, I don't know if I really want that guy to get saved. We need to remember something. We must remember that no one deserves salvation, including this guy, right? That's why it's a gift. Agrippa and Bernice arrive in full pageantry. That's what this word pomp means. It's like it's some fancy state affair. All to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, though they don't know it yet. I picture Paul coming in and him being excited. He's like, look at the audience they've brought for the gospel. And there's going to be a certain level of vindication here. Look at Acts chapter 25, verse 24. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are here present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. So again, we see this as a very formal event. He's using formal address. Uh, the Jews, he says, have been a uh, petitioning him in Jerusalem and in Caesarea. 
Festus makes it very clear they've made this formal request. They want Paul to be charged with crimes. However, they've already determined what the sentence should be. Right? They want Paul dead. And he says they're, they're crying out. It's, it's the idea of almost screaming. They're, they're going nuts. They're shouting and screaming for Paul to be killed. They have made many serious accusations. Uh, he will now have the opportunity to set the record straight. Okay? And these serious accusations, they're false. Right? We can expect the same level of opposition and hatred in our own lives. Okay? Jesus told us that. Turn to John 15. John 15 in the Pew Bible, that's 1243. It's just uh, one book to your left. John 15, verses 18 to 20. John 15, verse 18. Jesus says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. You know, one of the things I love about our Savior is that he um, doesn't pull any punches. <laughs> he, he doesn't try to butter it up. He's like, they hated me. They persecuted me. They're going to do the same thing to you. And we see that in Acts. We see that in other places in Scripture. We're seeing that beginning in our own country it's already happening across our world the world will hate us and that hatred is evident here with paul acts chapter 25 verse 25 but when i found that he had committed nothing deserving of death and that he himself had appealed to augustus i decided to send him yet again it's made clear that paul has done nothing wrong because of his appeal to caesar paul is going to be sent to rome so here is paul's vindication he's innocent the commander in Jerusalem said he was innocent. Felix saw that he was innocent. Now Festus has made the same determination. However, innocence doesn't lead to freedom here. God has a plan for Paul to preach the gospel in Rome, and this is how that plan will be accomplished. Part of the purpose here is for Paul to be vindicated before all of these people. These are people Paul would not have had access to apart from these circumstances. This is really important. I don't think that Paul could have just walked into the throne room of King uh, Augustus and said, hey or King Agrippa, and said, hey, can I talk to you about Jesus? He probably would have been thrown out. Here, in, in a complete twist, right, the king is asking to hear from Paul. Only our God can do that. This is a divine appointment. So here's our lesson. Divine appointments place us with purpose and timing. Would you read that with me, please? Divine appointments place us with purpose and timing. God puts us where he wants us, exactly when he wants us to be there. And we're going to learn exactly how precise his timing is in the week ahead. So these are people who need to be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is accomplished through these difficult circumstances, while simultaneously allowing Paul to be vindicated in regards to the crime that he has been accused of. It's made clear that he hasn't actually committed any crimes. And we could say, well, well, then why is he going? Why is he being given to uh, Caesar? Well, because that was their law. Okay, if you appealed to Caesar, you had to go. And so we might humanly think, oh man, I wish Paul wouldn't have appealed to Caesar. Well, first of all, if he hadn't, he'd be dead. Second of all, this is part of God's plan to get him to Rome so that he can share Christ there in Rome. Okay. So opportunity one, number one is proclamation. Opportunity number two is vindication. Opportunity number three, explanation. Explanation. Acts chapter 25, verse 26. I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore, I have brought him out before you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. So here we're given part of his motivation here with Festus, right? Festus needs some sort of charge to send to Caesar with Paul. Now, this is interesting, right? Because what did he just say? He just said he's innocent, but I need charges. <laughs> I, I, gotta, I gotta tell Caesar something about why, he's got, why I'm sending him on, so I need something to accuse him of, basically, right? Yeah, <laughs> King Agrippa is perceived by Festus to be more knowledgeable about spiritual matters than he is. They're going to have this investigation, this inquiry, so that Festus can have something to write about Paul. 
Because Paul has appealed to Caesar, he feels like, I gotta have a list of charges or something, right, to send with him. But folks, this is the measure of Paul's character. And I love this. So far, they have found no wrongdoing in Paul. They're having a second hearing just so they can explain why he's in custody at all. Paul describes the character a believer should strive for in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 9 to 12. If you would turn there, again, in our pew Bible, that's 1358. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Verses 9 through 12. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. That you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you that you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. So Paul has been found innocent over and over again. And when he writes to the Thessalonians, he says, this is the way we're supposed to live. We're to love one another. We're to lead a quiet life. We're to mind our own business, work with our own hands, and behave properly towards unbelievers. And this is how Paul has lived his life. A little bit of a side note, but you realize that every time you say mind your own business, you're quoting scripture? Huh. But what about you and me? Would there need to be a second hearing to figure out what to charge us with? <laughs> Paul says we're supposed to live us to a certain standard, a certain level. And I don't know about you, but I find that difficult. That's okay to struggle. It's not okay to surrender. <laughs> Say, well, I just won't try anymore. No. We battle. We fight until the day God calls us home. Acts chapter 25, verse 27. He says, For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. This always kind of makes me laugh. He's like, look guys, I need to write a letter to Caesar and I have to say why I'm sending Paul and I have no idea why I'm sending Paul. Help me out, would you? I mean, he's just saying we need to come up with some charges here. The end result of all of this is Paul being allowed to speak to this gathering. Paul will not just vindicate himself for his present accusations. He's going to explain why he arrived at the conclusions he now holds. Have you noticed that Festus sets him up perfectly here? Festus says, look, he, he's, he's in custody because there's this debate about this guy, Jesus. Um, and, you know, the, the Jews are saying he's dead. Paul's saying he's alive. I mean, could you ask for a more perfect setup? Well, let me talk to you about that. <laughs> We're going to see his full explanation over the next few weeks. But all of this is a divine appointment. God has orchestrated it all. Why? So that the gospel can go forward. Paul is going to offer his explanation, and in that explanation is going to be the gospel. So here's our lesson. When God provides an opportunity, take it. <laughs> Would you read that with me, please? When God provides an opportunity take it. This is our responsibility, to take advantage of the divine appointments that come our way. Divine appointments are not just about the child of God. They are primarily about those God brings us into contact with. A divine appointment is two or more parties meeting in which God has a plan and purpose for all involved. Okay? To take advantage of divine appointments, we must recognize them for what they are. <laughs> a divine appointment may be hidden in the negative, it may be directed through uncertainty. What a divine appointment will have is a person who needs the gospel and an opportunity for the child of God, the believer, to share the gospel. In a divine appointment, we have the opportunity to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. We may be vindicated with false accusations. We may have the, ability, the opportunity to explain our beliefs and circumstances, but here's the bottom line. A divine appointment is a God-ordained opportunity to share Christ. That's what it is. See, you have access to people that I'm never going to meet. There's people that you may sit down with at work. There's people you may sit down with uh, this next week at Thanksgiving that I'm never going to meet. I have people in my life that you're never going to meet. And so we have to be faithful in sharing the gospel as we have opportunity to those that God places us in contact with. 
The circumstances of our lives are orchestrated by God so that we can come in with contact with people who need Jesus. And so, three things. One, in your difficulty, look for opportunity. This is one of the ways that God has given us to, to bear trials, by looking for other people that we can talk with in those trials. Secondly, in your circumstances, look for a divine appointment. Look for a divine appointment. There's, there is one. It's there. We just got to see it. All of this is by God's design that Paul could have an opportunity to present the gospel to men and women of authority. And so thirdly, always take advantage of every, of every opportunity to present the gospel. Would you read that last one with me, please? Always take advantage of every opportunity to present the gospel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And we thank you for the example of Paul. And sometimes, Father, we're tempted to say, yeah, but that was Paul, and I, I could never be like that. And yet, Father, Paul was who he was simply because he submitted himself to you, to the Holy Spirit. And each one of us can do that. And so, Lord, I pray that as you provide us with opportunities, that we would take advantage of them, that we would see them, and that, Father, we would preach Christ at every opportunity. Pray, Father, that this week everything we do, everything we say, and everything we think will bring praise and honor and glory to you in your name. We pray this in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.